Hello! We are the Proton Temperatures team, and over these past two weeks, we have been working with the NASA C's High School Internship Program to compare various qualities of protons in the time before, during, and after coronal mass ejections using satellite data from Earth and Mars. Hey, I'm Jack Frangos, a rising senior going over there high school. I live in Atlanta, Georgia. Hi, my name is Varun Rodericks. I'm a rising senior at Medina High School in Ohio. Hi, my name is Alani Marie Sierra Colon. I'm 17 years old and I'm from Puerto Rico, Alta. I study in a school specialized in science and mathematics called Brigida Alvarez Rodriguez. Hi, my name is Hital Benwani. I'm a rising senior at Centennial High School and I live in Frisco, Texas. Hi, my name is Vika and I'm a rising senior from the suburbs of Philly. And our mentor for this project is Ms. Murthy Nath, a PhD candidate at UC Berkeley who also works at the Space Sciences Lab. CMEs are powerful solar eruptions that release vast amounts of plasma and magnetic fields from the sun's corona into space. Originating from areas of intense magnetic activity, such as sunspots, CMEs eject billions of tons of charged particles, traveling at speeds between 250 and 3,000 kilometers per second. When these particles reach Earth, they can cause geomagnetic storms, leading to intensified auroras, disruptions in satellite communications, and potential risks to astronauts. They occur with varying frequency depending on the solar cycle. During solar maximum, which is a peak of the approximately 11-year solar cycle, CMEs are more frequent and intense. And at this time, solar activity, including, including sunspots and flares, is at its highest, leading to a greater number of CMEs. This is the opposite when the solar minimum occurs. CMEs might occur less frequently, possibly only a few times a month. The aurora borealis, or northern lights, is a stunning natural light display seen in high latitude regions around the Arctic Circle. This phenomenon occurs when charged particles from the sun, known as solar wind, interact with the Earth's magnetic field and atmosphere. As these particles collide, with gases such as oxygen and nitrogen in the atmosphere, they create shimmering lights in various colors, including green, pink, red, and violet. This normally occurs in high-latitude regions near the Arctic Circle, including parts of Norway, Sweden, Finland, Canada, and Alaska, and they're most visible during winter months. The auroras are also more active during periods of high solar activity, which follows an approximately 11-year solar cycle. This is different on Mars. Aurora on Mars happens when charged particles from the sun, mainly solar wind, interact with Mars's localized magnetic field and atmospheric gases like carbon dioxide, producing that glow of ultraviolet colors. Unlike Earth, Mars lacks a global magnetic field, but its regional magnetic fields can trigger auroras, especially in southern hemisphere's volcanic regions. Martian auroras are more likely to are more likely during periods of high solar activity following an 11-year solar cycle. Although they're less vivid than Earth's aurora borealis, they can be best seen at night under clear skies. Our goal for this project were to identify signature for a previously studied CME, but using different institute air data, and use those markers to see if we could identify in studied CMEs, and to quantity how fundamental property of the solar wind changed to a CME at Earth compared to a CME at Mars. By studying this difference in how CMEs impact both planets, we can count to understand not only the history of Mars and how it go where to this today, but also how to protect astronauts aiming to set foot at red planet. We acknowledge the Community Coordinating Modeling Center, CCMC, at Goddard Space Flight Center for the use of GOES, DC Gov R and H data. We received the Mars data from Maven CY as well as G Helicast. The situation for all data will be included at the end of the slideshow. In the process, we graphed the land graph of 2018 Earth and Mars data to identify the patterns between before, during, and after CME heat. You set this person to figure out when 2021 CME began and ended. Do data from both CMEs and main Instagram of each piece of data, density, temperature, etc. 
before, during, and after CME. To observe how to probability distribution for each piece of data changes in different stages of CME. Starting with the 2018 Earth CME data, we observe that the density rises above pre-CME levels during the first CME and continues to increase into the second CME with a significant spike towards the end. The speed starts decreasing before the CME and continues to do so into the first CME before increasing about halfway through. During the second CME, the speed begins at a much higher level, decreasing initially and then rising again into the high speed winds that follow the CME. The temperature during both CMEs appears much less sporadic compared to the pre-CME temperatures with the notable bulge in the second CME. Let's move quickly to SIRs or slow fast stream interaction regions. SIRs occur when a faster solar wind overtakes a slower one causing a disturbance. Our data and literature suggest that the patterns we expect during the second CME at Mars align more closely with those of an SIR. Similar to Earth, the density during the first CME at Mars is greater than the pre-CME density. However, in the second CME or SIR region, we see massive spikes in density. We also observe a steady decrease in speed before the first CME, a slight increase during the first CME, and a large increase in speed during the second CME. The temperature flattens out during the first CME with a notable peak, followed by two distinct regions in the second CME, one at a lower temperature and one at a higher temperature. Looking at the histograms representing this data, let's focus on the temperature column. The mode temperature of both CMEs at Mars is higher than the mode CME temperature at Earth. Both distributions display bimodal behavior during the second CME, which can be explained by the rise in temperature observed towards the end of the second CME. For the 2021 Earth CME, we looked at data from the Discover, GOES, and ACE satellites. One of the most prominent features was an increase in proton flux values by an order of magnitude. Additionally, the KP index of the, from the NOAA spiked to values over 9. As for the CME at Mars, we were able to look at proton temperature, speed, and density from the Martian Maven satellite. The most significant feature was a clear spike in proton temperatures, along with a general increase in density and velocity values during the CME. Graphing the 2021 Earth CME data as histograms revealed more interesting trends. Temperature decreased by an average factor of 4 during the CME, then held a bimodal distribution for the rest of the CME, beginning to degrade post-CME. This is in line with what happened at Earth in 2018, albeit a bit weaker a bit weaker of an effect. In addition, velocity histograms revealed another bimodal split in the velocities, which had a peak increase of 300 kilometers per second during the CME, then post-CME underwent a 150 kilometer per second increase in ambient solar wind speeds, which is what we believe resulted in the aforementioned split. Looking at Mars data plotted as histograms, we will see, similar to previous trends, proton temperatures saw a marked decrease in response to the initial CME shock. However, unlike previous in instances, proton temperatures didn't assume as obvious of a bimodal distribution as they had in previous post-CME observations. Solar wind velocities saw little increase during the CME at Mars. However, post-CME, there was a significant increase of around 150 kilometers per second similar to what happened post-CMA at Earth in 2021. Lastly, <clears throat> there was a significant increase in proton density, going from an average of 1 per cubic centimeter to 10 per cubic centimeter during the CME, which resulted in a split. However, a similar effect was not observed at Earth in any previous observations. Comparing the 2021 versus 2028 CME effects, the 2021 CME had significantly more noticeable effect on proton flux at Earth than the 2018 CMEs. Additionally, proton temperatures at Earth in response to the CME seem to be bimodal in their distribution, and this trend was seen at Mars during the SIR, but not a CME, neither in 2018 nor the 2021 CMEs. Proton density enhancements were similar at both planets in response to the 2021 CME, 
about an order of magnitude enhancement from one per cubic centimeter to 10. And lastly, at Earth, the solar wind velocity distribution was isotropic and spread out across 200 to 600 kilometers per second compared to Mars, which showed a bimodal distribution with peaks at 350 kilometers per second and 500 kilometers per second. So to summarize our results, we found that the 2021 CME has a bigger impact on both Earth and Mars because we could identify direct responses to the CME in our time series data. We're also seeing that a bimodal temperature distribution was observed at Mars after the SIR, stream interaction region, that brushed Mars in 2018, but that wasn't the case for any of the CMEs that impacted Mars, which we studied. Overall, the proton densities changed similarly on both planets in response to a CME, but proton temperatures and proton velocities were impacted very differently on the two planets. So in conclusion, from what we found, the way that energy is exchanged by the Sun and its planets is different when the Sun interacts with Earth versus when it interacts with Mars. This is proved by the fact that, in response to the same CME, both Earth and Mars experience similar enhancements in proton densities, but different effects on the velocity and temperature of the solar wind. Both of these values were lower at Mars than at Earth. Additionally, the bimodal distribution of proton temperatures at Earth as a response to the CME should be further investigated. CMEs ejected from the sun cool differently than how the ambient solar wind cools, and we don't know why. More studies would help us understand why this happens. And finally, we need continuous space weather monitors at Mars if we want to send people there one day, even when the sun is in solar minimum. This is when SIRs are more likely. Because the many differences between the atmospheres and magnetic fields of Earth and Mars, which will impact how energy and momentum are exchanged between each planet and the sun, make it hard to predict how various factors like CMEs will impact Mars and consequently, any people living there. So, you cannot rob me of free nature's grace. You cannot shut the windows of the sky through which the aurora shows her brightening face. This excerpt is from the 18th century, and yet it still holds true today. We can't stop auroras or the CMEs that cause them. All we can do is keep learning about them so that one day we can traverse them without fear. We all had an amazing time during our C's internship. Some of the best parts were getting experience in research utilizing real satellite data, meeting other students interested in Earth and space science, listening to talks from so many people who already work in this field, working with an amazing mentor, and learning so many new things. Every day in this internship was a new adventure. However, we did face several challenges, including our time management with so much data to analyze, our asynchronous communication across time zones as a virtual group, and having to learn a lot about Python in order to write the code that would graph our data. Yeah, I think CIS has really been a beneficial experience in that it's taught me what it's like to do kind of like real research, which I hadn't really had the chance to do before. It's taught me to work with other like-minded people. It's taught me how to analyze data and, you know, overcome challenges. I think it's been a really useful experience for everyone in my group. I think my favorite part of working in the C's team was learning Python with everyone else, especially in the real application as opposed to the modules, because they were a lot different and it was a really fun challenge to overcome. This virtual internship helped me to know where I want to direct my studies and where I need to acquire more knowledge. Learning such an amazing fact about Mars helped me to understand the difference between Mars and Earth. But also, the most important thing, it led me to experience working with brilliant Mars, like my team members and mentors. Okay, so maybe this is a cliche, but I've been fascinated with space for as long as I can remember. I used to spend hours watching brain pop videos about black holes and exoplanets and any other space topic that I could find. The NASA SEAS program has really helped me reignite that interest and pushed it further than I ever could have imagined. This program has inspired me to want to keep learning about space in some capacity long into the future. I developed an interest in space from an early age when I used to read astronomy books with my dad. From the closest planets to the furthest galaxies, I read about everything in between, including black holes, dark matter, nebula, and more. Unfortunately, I'm far from knowing everything about space, which is why I love it so much. There is so much we have yet to learn, and when I grow up, I hope to be a part of those discoveries. The best part about this internship was some learning something completely new. 
It never occurred to me that CMEs would significantly affect Earth and even Mars, so it was really interesting analyzing all that data. CES has inspired me to consider pursuing a career at NASA working in Earth science or space. It's equipped me with the necessary skills to succeed in college and beyond. Thank you, everyone, for listening to our presentation. On behalf of all of us, a huge thank you to all of the CES staff and mentors, especially Ms. Miller, Ms. Baguo, and especially our team mentor, Ms. Noth. We literally could not have done it without you.